Good morning, everyone. My name is Arush Tutiki. And I'm Drew Grande. Our proposal is leveraging altered mechanobiology in space for improved nanoparticle-mediated gene delivery. So right now, our astronauts face a critical problem. Prolonged time and spaceflight conditions, such as microgravity, radiation, and oxidative stress, can cause severe and unwanted genetic dysregulation. And these alterations affect the function of almost every biological structure, posing a significant barrier to long-term space travel. And so our astronauts would benefit from gene delivery. In particular, siRNA, or small interfering RNA, is especially promising. It has the ability to selectively target and degrade any mRNA, and therefore knocks down the associated gene in a transient and reversible manner, qualities perfect for astronauts on spaceflight. Unfortunately, transfecting nucleic acids directly into cells is ineffective because they're quickly degraded by nucleases and they can't permeate through the cell membrane. So ideally, these compounds are packaged in nanoparticles, which both protects them and allows for permeation. Now this nanoparticle delivery pathway consists of two main steps, and these steps are often a barrier for gene delivery on Earth due to their inefficiency. But we believe that we can use microgravity as a platform to optimize both of these processes. First, we believe that altered fluid dynamics will improve siRNA loading into the nanoparticle. And second, we believe that cytoskeletal dysregulation will improve uptake of these compounds. And so our proposal centers around one question unanswered in previous literature. Can we leverage altered mechanobiology to optimize genomic treatments in space? To answer this question, we'll have to look at each process independently, beginning with nanoparticle loading and focusing on cationic liposomes the most experimentally validated nucleic acid carrier, characterized by their lipid bilayer. If this bilayer is too rigid, it will inhibit nucleic acid loading. To increase efficacy, we must increase fluidity. Unfortunately, this trades off with structural instability as a result of the osmotic pressure difference within the particle, forcing scientists to carefully optimize liposomal fluidity to balance between these two forces for maximal efficacy. In space, this process completely changes. The packing density of lipids in the bilayer drops, increasing fluidity and potentially loading capacity. Critically, this won't result in unwanted deformation because one of the driving forces behind the osmotic pressure difference are internal convective flows, largely controlled by gravity. In space, we think that deformation will drop, leading us to the hypothesis that the optimal fluidity for infection increases, which we'll validate with cholesterol which packs between lipids in the bilayer to increase liposomal fluidity. Phase two focuses on cellular uptake. The actin cytoskeleton regulates endocytosis, the driving force behind uptake on Earth, implying that a higher actin density increases treatment efficacy. In space, this structure is dysregulated, which should reduce endocytosis. That's why it's puzzling Yang et al., one of the major inspirations for our work, saw an increase in the treatment efficacy of nanoparticle nucleic acid compounds in simulated microgravity, leading us to hypothesize that reduced actin density in spaceflight relieves tension on the membrane and shifts the dominant uptake pathway to membrane fusion, where the bilayer of the particle and the cell merge. We'll validate this with biobits to express actin monomers, which will polymerize into fibers, and filament, which will interlace those fibers to increase density and membrane tension. So to test our hypotheses, we'll quantify two metrics with the P51 fluorescence viewer. We'll first measure siRNA loading with the ribogreen assay, where a dye binds to any siRNA not in the nanoparticle and fluoresces. So fluorescence intensity is dependent on the amount of unloaded siRNA. Next, we'll quantify knockdown by looking at the change in RFP expression before and after siRNA silencing treatment on our RFP-expressing endothelial cells. Now this change in RFP is an indicator of our treatment efficacy. So to perform both of these steps upon the resource constraints of the freeze and fly, we propose an innovative two compartment model. The inside compartment will have our liposomes and free siRNA, and the outside will have our cells and bio bits. Once thawed on the ISS, the liposomes will be loaded, will release the interior tube, allowing the nanoparticles to be uptaken by cells and starting our experiment. So for phase one, we'll have three groups. We'll first have our negative control, of scrambled siRNA, which can't bind to mRNA. Then we'll have our standard Earth-optimized liposomes, and then our fluidized cholesterol-boosted liposomes. For our loading assay, a lower fluorescence corresponds to greater siRNA loading. And we anticipate that in space, 
loading will increase due to the higher liposomal fluidity. And for the same reason, we believe the fluidized cholesterol liposomes will have greater siRNA loading than the standard. Now for our knockdown test, a lower fluorescence also corresponds to greater gene knockdown. Despite the increased siRNA loading in the fluidized liposomes, we believe that on Earth, this modification will actually decrease knockdown due to the increased nanoparticle deformation. But in space, we believe that it will increase knockdown as it has the increased siRNA loading without the associated nanoparticle deformation. Now for phase two, we'll have another negative control of scrambled siRNA, but on filament-treated cells. Then we'll have the same standard as before with our standard cells, and then we'll have our RFP siRNA, but on filament. In space, we expect the primary internalization route for nanoparticles to be membrane fusion due to the reduced actin density on the ISS. And so we believe that the filament treatment, which increases actin density, will inhibit this pathway, and therefore it will reduce knockdown, which you can see as an increase in fluorescence. However, on Earth, we believe that the filament treatment will increase knockdown, as it will boost the actin density and therefore endocytosis, the primary uptake on Earth. To further prove our second hypothesis, our ambitious experiment will leverage confocal microscopy and fluorescently labeled nanoparticles to map cellular uptake. We anticipate that in the standard group in spaceflight, dye will localize along the membrane, indicating a shift to fusion, while in the remaining groups, endocytosis will predominate. Now that we've validated both hypotheses on a model system, we'll leverage these insights to treat actual spaceflight diseases, focusing on hypoclostremia, defined by NASA as a potent yet understudied threat to astronauts, caused by altered cholesterol fluidics and radiation-accelerated biosynthesis. Part of the reason why the risk of cardiovascular disease-induced mortality in deep space astronauts is four times higher than expected. Traditionally, we'd solve this problem with statins, which upregulate LDL receptors, the body's primary cholesterol filtration mechanism. Unfortunately, statins induce myopathy, untenable for astronauts who already experience significant <coughs> muscular atrophy. We think a better solution is PCSK9, one of the most upregulated components of the genome in space that has yet to be explicitly analyzed, which is really surprising because silencing this gene accelerates cholesterol filtration, the reason why it's one of only seven clinically approved siRNA targets. Our experiment will consist of our optimized genomic treatment on hepatocytes, genetically engineered so their LDL receptors are tagged with GFP1 through 10. We'll use BioBits to express a fusion complex of GFP11 and Apollo lipoprotein B, the primary LDL transport vector. Independently, neither compound fluoresces, but together they'll glow green for the quantification of surface-bound LDLR, which we anticipate is down-regulated in spaceflight, indicating a novel driver of astronaut cardiovascular disease. We think that statins will solve this problem for a short period, but our optimized genomic treatment will perform the best reverting LDLR back to Earth levels. So, to recap, our freeze and fly part one will improve liposomal loading without unwanted deformation, shown with the fluorescent ribogreen assay. Then, we'll identify a shift to membrane fusion and spaceflight, shown with biobits to express actin monomers and filament A, and further validated with confocal microscopy. Finally, we'll combine these two insights to develop a novel treatment for spaceflight CBD that outperforms traditional alternatives, quantified with a split GFP reporter. So, Drew and I have talked a lot today about the specifics of our project, the technicalities, but what actually matters, the reasons why you should care about our work today, are the ways that we could advance science as a whole. First and foremost, our novel mechanism to improve genetic delivery will yield key insights into nanoparticle manufacturing, for siRNA, but also for a whole host of other compounds rapidly growing in clinical importance. Next, understanding how the internalization of extracellular payloads differs in cells with cytoskeletal dysregulation can help us design new treatments for conditions in spaceflight, but also for a variety of diseases on Earth. And finally, and most importantly, we can leverage and expand our newly optimized pathway deployed on PCSK9 and hypoclestremia to correct the inherent genomic dysfunction associated with space travel, providing protection for the health of our astronauts for years to come. We'd like to thank our mentor, Marissa, and our sponsor, Dr. Nuruddin, without whom none of this would be possible, the Genes in Space and many PCR Bio teams, 
the generous donors to this program, and of course, you all in the audience. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. <laughs>